Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So welcome to the first plenary session of the Microsoft Software Summit here in Paris. It's wonderful to have so many faces that I know here and also so many faces that we don't know and that we will get to know over the next three days. Uh, later on this afternoon, I'll give you a few of the stats about the people who are here. But right now, uh, this is just a call to order and the person who is going to actually introduce and welcome you all to the Software Summit is Andrew Herbert. Now, Andrew is chairman of Microsoft Research for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. And in this position, he oversees all the technical strategy and policy engagements in this region. Uh, he's responsible for engagement with politicians, officials, and professional and industry bodies, as many of you heard this morning, and their strategy advice. Initially, he joined Microsoft Research in 2001 as assistant director, and then he succeeded the existing, the then director, Roger Needham, in March 2003. And his current role, he started in November last year. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce my uh, distinguished and great friend, Andrew Herbert. Thank you, Judith. So hopefully this, see, this will be my slides. Um, so I'd like to add my own words of welcome to this, our first European Software Summit. Um, I'm looking forward to spending time with you throughout the remainder of this week talking about current themes and issues in computer science research. Um, obviously, we'd like to highlight some of the things that we do in Microsoft Research here in Europe and at our other laboratories. Thank you. My beautiful assistant is arranging my slides for me. We've, how many years have we known each other? I think the first time was I was a junior faculty member <laughs> and, and you were as well when you came on sabbatical in, in Cambridge. That's right. We're very proud of the research presence that we have here in Europe. Um, we are, we're going to play a video and then I'll say some more words. partnership between the Connect team and Microsoft Research has allowed us to make tomorrow happen today. The feedback that we've got from users about PhotoFuse has been amazing, and we know we couldn't have brought this feature to our users without the collaboration with Microsoft Research. What's fun about Microsoft Research is that we're constantly exploring, you know, looking for the best ideas. We're taking things that people thought were improbable and making them possible, and then taking them all the way to reality. So a very quick snapshot of, of Microsoft Research and the challenge is how many of the people in the video will you recognize from their talks later on in the, uh, the event today. So I'd like to welcome you to our Software Summit. This is the first Software Summit that we've had in Europe. 
our aim in, in putting on this event um, is for an opportunity to talk to you about some of the research we do, what we see as some of the important themes and challenges, where there are opportunities for collaboration. We'd like to learn about the research that you're doing that is, is complementary and that we can leverage together. We've also, um, starting with the workshops that we had this morning and running as a theme through some of the discussions, is also to talk about shared concerns around topics like research funding, how students should be taught, um, the strength of European science and, and priorities and so forth. Very much like to see this as building on conversations many of us have already, using the summit to pull those together. And if this event is a success, as I very much hope it will be, something that we can repeat um, and do again in other cities and other parts of, of Europe um, as a, a regular event um, to help stimulate and drive forward the, the community. So let me just tell you a little bit about Microsoft Research as an organization. Many of the faces I see in the audience are very familiar. Um, you know this well, but I also see some new ones. Um, we are Microsoft's corporate research facility. We're a independent division within the company. We're centrally funded, and our mission is to do basic research in computer science. We have six main labs um, across the, the planet in the major geographical regions. In the USA, Redmond is the original and oldest of the Microsoft laboratories. That has its 20th anniversary in the autumn of this year. The European lab is in Cambridge in England, where, as Jude said, I was managing director until recently, and now I've handed over to my colleague, Andrew Blake, who I'm sure is going to take the Cambridge lab on to even greater and better places than I was able to do. We were the first overseas laboratory created when um, the Redmond Lab was five years old, so we're just approaching our 15th anniversary. And the motivation to have a lab in Europe was very clear, to tap into the European talent pool, a recognition that there are areas of computer science in which Europe had, had great strength, um, which a company like Microsoft needed access, and indeed a recognition that there are unique things about the, the European market that we um, wanted to be able to access and understand. If you think back 15 years, that was the time when Europeans had cell phones and they worked, and Americans barely had them in major cities. And I remember back in those days, standing on the mobile phone on the Great Wall of China, phoning my wife, and I what a wonderful experience it was, and one of my American colleagues complaining that his mobile phone couldn't even be used within, within one city to phone the suburb where his, his family lived. Um, things have changed since then, um, but I think there are many areas of technology where Europe still has a, a very strong leadership role. And the fact that we are a very multi multicultural society, I think, brings us many interesting opportunities as well. We were followed a year later um, by our colleagues in Beijing, um, our Asia lab, and then more recently, um, we've added our lab in Bangalore, in India, following the economic growth and emergence of those countries. We have two further um, smaller laboratories in the US these days. We have one in Silicon Valley, and as you might imagine, that lab came into existence as internet technologies became more and more important for Microsoft. And just to confuse everyone, we have a lab in the other Cambridge, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, as they got there a bit late, they have to call themselves Microsoft Research New England. Um, and some of you, you may know there's a famous university called Harvard in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Harvard was a Cambridge, England graduate, so it all gets very, very confusing. Those are, are our main labs. Um, if I drill down into Europe, we have some very deep partnerships with a number of um, institutions where we've put together joint research centers, where we've been working together for, for many years now. Um, starting with, with here in Paris, we've had a very strong partnership with IMRIA, the French National Computer Science Laboratories. We have a, a joint center um, just outside Paris in, in Sacre, one of the, 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 the new clusters that's being developed. Um, that's where we do a great deal of joint research on topics like software verification, um, theorem proving, applications of computer science to um, scientific computation, human computer action, a, a wide range of areas. And you find a mixture of IMRIA and Microsoft researchers working together with jointly funded postdocs and, and PhD students. And that's been a, a very exciting venture. We've always had a, a very strong collaboration with IMRIA and it's been nice to manifest that as a center. And I know many people here attended their forum where they presented their results yesterday. And that's, that's been a very successful organization. In addition, um, we have a joint center with the University of Trento in Italy. This is focused on computational systems biology. This is using computer science models to model um, biological systems at the scale of the human cell up to ecosystems. Our aim in, in that investment, which also is, I think, about six years old now, 
was to help bootstrap new capability and capacity in Europe, um, building around a, a very strong research collaborator, Corrado Priami. That has been very successful um, alongside our investment to help them get start, started. They've had fantastic investment from the European Union, from various scientific foundations and so forth, and are now operating on a much more independent basis, which is fantastic to see. And I think one of the roles of industry is to help get new things started. We have a very good collaboration um, with the um, Polytechnic University in Catalonia, of Catalonia in Barcelona, where we work together on issues around parallel computing and where we bring together our expertise, perhaps more on the software side, with their expertise more on the hardware side, and look at that hardware-software interface. Um, and interestingly, although the focus is parallel computation, um, and many people know of Barcelona as, as the home of a supercomputer, one of the projects there is vector graphics processing for mobile phones, so bringing some of those ideas down to smaller-scale systems too. So those collaborations are very important to us, and the orange dot on the screen um, is another laboratory uh, which reports into my organization, our European Microsoft Innovation Center in Arken, where we look at technologies for embedded systems, um, real-time in and embedded systems, particular focus on the automotive sector, um, thinking about how cars will, will connect and leverage internet services. We already today know how entertainment, satellite navigation, a certain amount of maintenance and monitoring, environmental sensing, traffic management, um, building on, on those technologies. And finally, but by no means least, we have our innovation center in Cairo, in Egypt. Um, it's been an exciting time for employees in that laboratory in, in recent months. Um, their focus is um, looking at research into technologies that allow the company to deliver its products and services, particularly in the Arabic world, although that very rapidly generalizes into um, other cultures that, that rely on complex scripts and so a lot of work on natural language processing, um, content management, how you get content in other than Western languages onto the World Wide Web, how you do multilingual searching, and so forth. So a very large R&D presence, both of our own laboratories, um, our um, advanced development centers like Arkham and Cairo, and our academic collaborations. So I take you into our Cambridge laboratory. This is our building for about two more years. We're, we're commissioning a new building. Those, those of you who visit us will be pleased to know the new building is nearer the railway station. Um, it's in the old freight yard of the railway station, in fact. Um, and if you come visiting Cambridge um, in the next few weeks, you can see the demolition of the old building before our new one is erected in its place. And we'll be moving in, in in 2012. So the mission for all the Microsoft Research Labs is very simple. This mission was set by Rick Rashid when he was hired to create the Microsoft Research Organization. Unusually for industry, we've kept the same mission statement throughout our history. We've carefully avoided changing it. Um, the company has changed around us, but the mission seems always to put us in good position. And it starts with a research objective that I'm sure every academic in this room will resonate with. Our goal is to advance the state of the art in computer science. Um, we research things that interest us. Some are driven by curiosity, a desire to discover, to discover new things. Some are, are driven more by an application. People want to see how technology can be developed to solve a specific problem. Often those two things feed off each other in interesting and fascinating ways. And our, our model of how we conduct our research, hire smart people, put them in the laboratory, give them the resources they need, and then as management we try and stay out of the way. Um, where we come and help them more is particularly with the, the second part of our mission, which is to make sure we transfer the the knowledge, the understanding, the technologies that come from that research into the Microsoft products and business groups to help, help make sure that Microsoft remains a, a, a competitive and, and powerful company in the industry. And indeed, if you ask senior executives from other divisions of Microsoft, you know, why does the company invest in, in basic research? They will explain our existence by pointing to things in our track record that have had an impact on the company. Um, it was Microsoft Research who helped the company adopt the TCP IP protocols. It was Microsoft Research that helped build the company's first search engine when we realized that having our own one might actually be important to us. Um, it was Microsoft Research who invented in, in 3D um, computer graphics, which is the foundation of the Xbox business, um, and increasingly what we're doing in, in the, the PC world. And there's a whole raft of other important technologies in products Indeed, several business divisions in Microsoft that essentially were incubated in research. And so we're measured um, as our exhaust pipe, our impact, and as lab directors, 
our, our model is, is to hire the best researchers we can in the hope that they will keep putting things in that pipeline. Um, and we have that nice kind of three, five year lag um, on which the, the company trusts us with the, the research initiatives we undertake. And so our mission as an organization really is kind of captured by the, the last bullet, um, which is about leading Microsoft into the future. And that includes doing things in our laboratories, which today might even seem disruptive or hostile to the company. Understanding other approaches to solving problems, um, understanding competitive ideas, things that might be complete changes in how the business is done, obviously understanding disruptive technologies um, and getting to grips with those things so that when the company comes to compete with those things or adopt them um, or respond to them in some way, research can help the company do that. So our culture is one which will be very familiar to anyone who's, who's worked in a, a leading academic institution. Um, we hire smart people. We very much um, let them work on the projects they want to. Our organizational structures are, are very light. We, we loosely group people into teams based around their, their intellectual interests. Um, the Cambridge Warwick I know best, we, we, we describe in terms of, of five areas of research around programming, around machine learning, around systems and networks, around computer living, around computational science. But those are very broad labels. At any point in time, there are lots of projects going on. Some projects have names, some projects don't have names. There's no formal mechanism for joining a project or leaving a project. And part of the challenge as a, as a lab director or, or a chairman for the area is updating your slide deck at about the same speed at which the, ch the researchers are changing the research program. So it can be an interesting challenge. Most of our researchers come to us from academia, um, either as um, young postdocs or established figures who want to come and spend time working industry and seeing their research having a, an impact on, on, on products and, and systems that, that people use. Obviously, we also have some colleagues who come to us from other industry laboratories. Um, and we have a very strong relationship of partnering collaboratively with colleagues in, in universities worldwide. Obviously, Europe is the center of gravity of that. It's easier to collaborate with people who are next door than with people who are thousands of miles away. Um, but our outlook is, is entirely global. And if I talk about collaboration, um, much of it is informal, it's people visiting, it's students coming as interns. Um, some of it is certainly funded through the Microsoft Research Connections programs, and indeed this event is being um, run and organized um, for us by the Microsoft Research Connections team. I'd like to very much thank them for that. That's the organization headed by my good friend and colleague, Tony Hay. Um, and they run our, our more formal programs for collaboration and funding and so forth. And we try and make sure that the informal side and the formal side overlap and work well in, in partnership and uh, obviously part of this event is to help you learn more about those and, and become more engaged and give us feedback on how we can make these things work more effectively for you as well as getting the results from them that, that we want. So why are we in Europe? Why is Europe important to us? Um, there is deep scientific and engineering expertise. People who came to the panel I ran this morning um, about research funding, I think many of the speakers showed us statistics that demonstrated that European research is very strong, very vibrant, um, often amongst the most efficient in the world if you measure it in terms of citations out for dollars put in. Um, we have many challenges in the current um, financial context and so forth. Um, we are, I think, very strong in disciplinary research. We have to thank the European Union for some of its programs that have broken down barriers between countries, made it easier for to collaborate, made it easier for people to move around and encouraged a strong sense of, of collaboration and interaction between industry and university, which is, is to our strength. And so that connectedness is, is very important. And then the, the, the diversity. Um, the great thing about Europe is uh, many of us, um, we enjoy our own national characteristics. We joke with each other about the, the strange nature of the British and the French and the Germans and the Italians. Um, indeed, one presenter this morning said, well, you asked a Swiss, you gave a, a Swiss German a list of questions, so I'll now answer every one of your questions. Um, there are people, other nationalities, who chose to answer a different set of questions. That's how it works. Um, we enjoy that diversity and richness, and I think that is important. Technology is now global, um, and therefore the technologies we develop have to respect and understand how to live in diverse environments, what are the impacts of different cultures, and it's deeper than just you know, language and so forth. Um, what is the role of, of technology in, in different societies than, than just um, those of the, of the developed world. So that's very important to us. So um, I'm not going to read the program to you, just talk about its broad shape. 
We're starting with a keynote from my colleague Ken Wood. Um, I think my second or third hire, I'm not sure, into the, the Cambridge Laboratory. Um, joined very early on in my days as managing, in fact, joined my predecessor was still the managing director. Is going to give us a keynote um, on what lies beyond software. We do quite a lot, actually, of hardware research in the Cambridge Laboratory and, and how people interact with, with technology. Ken will talk about that. We then divide into sessions, um, and so please pick your tracks. Um, of which one will interest you, semantic computation on software agents, um, parallelism, how we can bring theory and practice together, and a, a third track on massively parallel systems. And I think these are all very important agendas. Certainly one of my um, sensations is we're seeing significant changes in the computing landscape driven by cloud computing, driven by multi-core. We're grappling with having lots of things going on in our systems gives us huge challenges in how we program those things, how we think about and conceive of the software systems. And so those three sessions, I think, will cover much of that territory. Then at the end of the day, we have a panel where a group of us will be invited to try and guess what we'll be talking about 20 years from now. So I take that as a vote of confidence from my colleagues in Microsoft Research Connections that we'll be doing this in 20 years' time and can be held to account for what we said. Well, I suspect I might be retired by then. Um, and then this evening we have um, buses taking us to a, a cruise on the Seine with dinner, which I'm looking forward to. That should be great fun. Tomorrow we start with a keynote key from my colleague, Wolfram Schulter, um, who will talk to us about software engineering research um, in, in Microsoft Research and his vision of the future of that. Um, then break out into three sessions again um, with more of a focus um, on, on web and cloud uh, and a particular um, panel looking at the embedded application area in particular focus on my colleagues in our Arkham laboratory, although they have many partnerships with colleagues in Cambridge working on things like theorem proving and so forth. After that, we have a lot of, of demonstrations. Hopefully you'll visit those, talk to the researchers and interact. Um, our third session, um, looking at natural interfaces, looking at um, handling some of the, the data challenges and looking at how we can do experimental work to drive forward the agenda in, in software verification and indeed convince other developers that they should be using these techniques. Getting over that user barrier, I think, is very hard. Um, then a second session, um, natural interface tools, how we put tools in the hand of students, and the, the verification theme continues as a, as a second half. And then we close. Um, your, your, your own um, discretion as to how you spend the, the evening on the, the second day. And then we wrap up on the, the third day. Again, um, a mixed session. Bugs, reconfigure all computing, verifying systems programs, keynote on open source, where that fits in, in that world. Um, that's always been an interesting topic for us in Microsoft, and I'm sure many of you have seen the Microsoft corporate position on open soft um, change significantly over the time um, I've been with the company. So I'm not taking credit for that change. I have also seen that change. Um, and we have um, a nice talk there from Brendan Icke of Mozilla Corp and Tony will talk about the, the Microsoft view of this. Um, then we have a workshop, tutorial, and a panel, and we close the event at, at 5 o'clock. So I hope you'll find the, the summit useful and worthwhile. I'm sure like many events, there'll be as much value, if, if not more, in the coffee breaks and the, um, and the lunches and the evening events and the, the, the lectures are where you sit back and relax and learn something new to build up your energy for the next conversation with colleagues in the breaks. So the, the next speaker is Ken Wood, who's going to talk about Beyond Software, and I believe, Judith, you're going to do the introductions. Yeah. Okay, so it's my great pleasure now to introduce Ken Wood. And Ken, of course, is the Deputy Managing Director at the same lab as um, Andrew is, and he has the also the distinction of heading up a division there, which I will tell you about, but in his capacity as Deputy Managing Director at Microsoft Research Lab, he's responsible for the lab's business-facing activities, including technology transfer incubation and licensing, spin-outs, and other models of intellectual property. So he also oversees the lab's marketing and communication activities. The lab that he does head up is the Communicate, uh, sorry, the Computer Mediated Living Research Group, CML, which he founded in 2003, which is quite a long time ago. And from that, 
He's going to tell us quite a bit about what has happened in that lab, and it's fundamentally interdisciplinary, bringing together hardware engineering, computer science, psychology, and sociology to address the problems of designing innovative technology of today. Uh, from these kinds of things, we have had amazing uh, work in Microsoft Research, which uh, have, has an, enabled us to make great strides, and some of those will be announced during the course of this summit. So keep your ears pinned to the ground. And meanwhile, it uh, is going to um, be my pleasure to invite Ken to come up. Thank you, Ken. Thank you very much, Judith. Um, I noticed we're running slightly behind time, so I'll try not to keep Oh, you want to give the, 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 break. the big thing here. So we go like this. And then it's going to okay. be off, and I right. can go to you. There yeah. we go. Uh, and then we go there. There we go. Yeah. Mind attention. Thank you. Pardon me? I believe it's on. Is it, is it on? It's not. Oh. I thought I had turned it back on. Yeah, it's on here. Can you hear me? Yeah? OK, thank you. Um, right. Thank you very much. Uh, today, what I really want to talk about is software which is not surprising since we're at uh, a software summit. But really what I want to talk about is the kind of technological landscape that software sits in and how the, um, um, the evolution of that landscape changes the way that we need to think about what software does in, a, in our very rapidly changing technological landscape. So as a little exercise, I thought we just should take a look at really how this landscape has changed. Now, I think a lot of us, we're all in this field. A lot of us have done this exercise mentally, if not written it down over the years. But it's nonetheless worthwhile to go through this and think about how things have changed. So when I was an undergraduate starting at Harvard in the early 80s, I did most of my programming on a PDP-1170, macro-11 coding on a PDP-1170. Um, and now, uh, in my pocket, I'm carrying around that phone. So in today's dollars, a PDP-11 would cost about $62,000. Now, to be, to be generous, the phone would cost about $500, probably less than that if you get it on some kind of package, of course, but it's worth about $500. It's a factor of 124. This phone is 124 times cheaper than the PDP-11 that I used when I was starting out. They didn't really measure these things then, but roughly the PDP-11 was a 20 megahertz machine. In my phone, I've got a one gigahertz processor. That's a factor of 50. You multiply those two things, 6,000 times more CPU cycles per dollar on this thing that I'm carrying around in my pocket than in that PDP-11. 128K of memory in the PDP-11, and that's being generous because only 64K of it was addressable. How much memory have I got in my pocket? Nine gigabytes of memory, a gig of RAM, eight gigs of flash, 70,000 times as much memory as in that PDP-11 is in my phone, 70,000 times. As you can see, the PDP-11 was as big as a fridge, maybe slightly bigger. My phone is not as big as a fridge. It's, it's in my pocket now. PDP-11, much heavier than a fridge. My phone, 130 grams. I can put it in any, any of my pockets and not even know it's there. So just think about this. Even those of us in the field, at least I find this, I am continually amazed at how much things have changed. The processing power we're all carrying around in our pockets is just infinitely in fridge size, heavier than fridges, much less powerful things. But that's not all. That's not all, folks. It's a phone. There's radios all over this thing. There's a, there's a 3G radio, there's Bluetooth radio, there's a Wi-Fi radio. Your phone can talk to almost any other computing device on the planet, one way or another, through the cloud, peer-to-peer. -peer. It's just incredible what has happened. What you're carrying around is just phenomenal. And so I want us to think about that and to think about what that means for software. And I try, I've, I've been thinking about this for a while. I've been trying to think about how to articulate this. So I think what we want to ask ourselves is, what is software? Now, I know a lot of us, in fact, I've met one of my, one of my um, old colleagues who looks at this. A lot of us in the past have looked at software as a mathematical construct. What can we, how can we reason about it, what it does? Some of us think about how it impacts how we build operating systems for computers of various types. I want to take a higher level view of that and just think that at any given point in time, there is a boundary of the technology that we have. There's a certain amount of stuff that we could do if we use, if we use the if the technology as well as we could, we can only get to a certain place. And software is what lets us take that technological material that we have to hand and turn it into something. 
Turn it into something for people. Now, in the old days, in the sort of DOS era, which is also just the, the latter end of the PDP-11 type era, we really could only talk about turning that technological material into, into solutions to problems. We were solving things. When I was writing my Macro 11 code, it was mainly writing simulations to generate single numbers that were answers to problems, that, that kind of thing. But as the technology has moved along, as we've got toward this phase, it's much more about generating experiences for people. So software is an, is a, an agent for turning the technological material of the day into experiences. So just in order to give you one small illustration of that, let me turn to my colleague Tim Regan and play you a little video of Tim's about a project we did in the Computer Media Day Living Group a few years ago now, actually, called Grab and Share. So I'm going to turn it over to Tim briefly. I hope this works. And just... Hello. I'd like to show you Grab and okay. Share, a prototype we've been working on can recently. You, can you all hear that? We've been involved with the broadcast and the transmission industries, looking at mobile TV and mobile video. And one of the things that struck us as researchers was the way in which mobile video was used as social capital in people's day-to-day -day lives. For example, you might take a video with you when you meet your friends, show it to them, and share a laugh with them, as one would a joke. So we built Grab and Share to explore that idea. Let me show you it. Imagine you're sat at home, watching TV, and a clip comes up that you know a friend would enjoy. You can now browse to that clip on your mobile phone, and then download it. In this scenario, the friend then turns up and you can go and greet them at the door and then show them the clip. If they like it, they may ask for a copy and Grab and Share allows you to send it to them over Bluetooth. Once they have it, they can play it or share it with their friends as well. So that's Grab and Share. And I hope it shows you that Mobile TV, as well as moving TV in terms of time or place that you can watch it, also adds a social dimension, new social scenarios that were lacking from fixed TV. Thank you. Mobile video as social capital. That's what Tim said early on in that thing. Mobile video as social capital. Think about that. Even 10 years ago, much less 20 years ago, we couldn't have conceived of of, even, of, of an application like that, where mobile video in itself was just in its, in its infancy. But the idea of being able to easily pass it around and subtly notice that um, there was an interaction between the video that was on the broadcast TV and the video in his pocket, that happened in the cloud. So there's a whole cloud thing going on to enable that, what seems to us, relatively simple application. Mobile video as social capital is an experience that we couldn't have thought about generating earlier. And it's essentially generated by software bridging that gap between, well, the, taking us somewhere along that spectrum of what we can do with the, the technology that we have. So if we go back to this graph, um, the other aspect of this, you see that the yellow line, which kind of represents what, we, what software generates for us, goes up and down. Because in any given era, what we have to hand, we can be good or bad at writing software to take advantage of that and generate what are now experiences. And, um, uh, and also, in any given, at any given time, there is a space between the yellow and the blue lines, which are things that we, that we could do, but we haven't done. And another point that I want to make is that space is getting enormous, because the blue curve is just going, is going up in the sky so quickly that what we can do is almost lim limitless. And so we now have to start sort of thinking about what we should do. And one of the things that I want to talk about as well is how we can make it easier to, to decide what we, what we should do. And that's going to be part of my talk later. Um, but let me also, let me turn now to another experience. Uh, just to say that they don't all have to be about small portable devices. Um, you've all heard of the Microsoft Surface, I assume, but if not, it's a, a, a multi-touch interactive tabletop um, computer that you can see somebody designing a, a skateboard with there. Um, now, this isn't actually a cutaway of the Surface, but it could be. This is a cutaway of an advance to the Surface that we've done in the Cambridge lab uh, called Second Light, which I'll tell you about in a bit. But to explain, just in case you don't know, the way that the Surface works is there's a translucent tabletop Surface, and underneath it, a PC, a projector, and a camera. And the PC projects the output of, or sorry, the, the 
projector projects the output of the PC onto the screen that you see at your tabletop. The camera lets um, the, your finger touches on the translucent screen be seen uh, and used as input to the uh, PC. Uh, and you can then interact with the PC. Now, the point I wanted to make here with this is that I told you how fantastically fast computing technology was advancing uh, in that first slide. But there are also advances that go hand in hand with that to let us do things that aren't necessarily just about electronics. And in this case, it was a piece of materials science that gave us a little edge to try and do something different. Because on second light, on the Microsoft Surface, the Surface is simply a, um, a, um, a translucent piece of plastic, essentially. In second light, it's a piece of very special material that in one state is a piece of translucent plastic, but by applying an electrical current to it, it becomes completely clear. And that can happen 120 times a second. So we thought about, well, what, what could we maybe do with that? What experiences could we generate with that? So I've got a little video. It's a little bit dim, but I'll play this for you. And you can get an idea for what that enables. So what you should see at first, if this is going to work, and it's not going to work. Let's try it again. Uh, here we go. So you, you can see uh, somebody interacting with this surface, drawing on the surface, which is, and that's, that's the kind of thing which you can do with an ordinary Microsoft Surface, right? You can, you can basically interact with it using your fingers on the surface. And more than one person can do it at once. You can use more than one finger at once, and so on. And it can show images on a surface. You'll see an image of flowers on, on the surface. But second light can show images through a surface as well. So what you see there is a, an ordinary piece of translucent tracing paper. And importantly, you can see that uh, when the tracing paper was on the surface, there was an, a different image, an image of sharks. But even when you pick the paper up, you still see the image of the sharks on the paper. It's really quite magical when you see this happen. Um, and even more magical is that it can do these things at the same time. So there you see the image of the sharks on the paper, the image of the flowers underneath them at the same time as you move the paper around. It's really quite amazing. Now, because I've, I've kind of given the trick away as to how this works, but I'll, I'll let the, the explanation come through very quickly. So basically, now we have two projectors underneath, two cameras for reasons that I don't need to go into, and that electrically switchable thing at the top, which can go from clear to translucent 120 times a second. And so all we do is when it's clear, we're shining one image, and when it's opaque, we're shining another. So you, see, uh, you can see two completely different interactive experiences on something that's held, that's, uh, that's on the surface and, something, so, and something, that, something that's held above it. So there's some applications of this, the so-called magic lenses. So you can imagine you've got a, a photograph of the night sky. You throw a frosted glass disc down, and you can look through. You can, you can overlay um, uh, the, the diagram of the constellations on top of that photograph of the night sky. Or you can be designing a car. You can see the external part of the car. These magic lenses can be used to look to the interior. And these are just ordinary things. So there we've put a frosted glass disc and a piece of tracing paper down. And both of those give you access to the internals of the um, And there's some fun things that you can do. You can take a translucent prism object. And you can, you can, you know, you can imagine what we're doing there. You can do all sorts of fun things with, with sort of physical objects linked to the, um, to the. But this is probably the most interesting thing. So remember, this thing is clear half the time. So you can see through it. If you're underneath it, you can see through it half the time. So we can, we can actually track your hands not just when they're touching the surface, but when they're above it. And that lets us do the following. So I hope you can see this well. But you can see that the person's hands are being held above the screen, and we're still interacting with it. Now, the magic lenses thing is really, it, it, is, it is quite magical to see. It doesn't seem to me that that's a real killer application of this. There is a killer application, though, which is 3D interaction. 3D rendering is becoming much more common. It's very easy to get packages where you can design 3D objects, you can render them. Uh, but interaction techniques for 3D on a 2D system are actually not so well thought out. And if you think about it, if you had a an ordinary surface computer, and you wanted to put one of those balls in the cup, what would the interaction paradigm be? How could, how could you do it? You, you really couldn't. Let me just play this little video, and you'll see what I mean. So, so this person is, is using the 2D interaction techniques to push balls around on the surface. But if he wants to pick a ball up and put it in the cup, how can he do it? Well, you'll see in a, in a second that this is looking up through the thing. When, when the thing is clear, we can see your hands. We can use grade level estimation to, to know roughly how high his hands are. And we can look at gestures, say we can easily detect a pinch gesture like that. 
So suddenly, we, have, we, can, we, can, we can generate a very easy interaction technique for picking something up, a 3D object up, and dropping it down, as you'll see just in a second. So you can lift up the ball, put it over the cup, and drop it in. Hey, presto. And I think this is amazing. Right? I think this is something where a sort of small advance in some ways in materials science, coupled with that tremendous advance in computational power that I've been talking about, because that's key here too, generates another set of new experiences along that line. So, oh, and this actually just as a sort of, as a kind of a side in my abstract, I mentioned that I'd be talking about hardware projects that we're doing um, in the lab where we want to get the hardware out of the lab and, and into people's hands. Second Light is actually one of those projects. So it's proved to be a little, there's, there's some sort of regulatory issues because it's a big power hungry thing. But nonetheless, we, people in, uh, some academics in Barcelona already have one of these units to experiment with. And if you're interested in this area, you know, get, get, it, get in touch with us because it's one of the things that we want to do, this whole idea about the hardware software boundary we want to get other people working in this area, so, so do get in touch. So now, now back to the regularly scheduled program. Things have changed, right? I think I keep making this, but things really, really have changed. So back in the era when I was at my VT220 doing Macro 11 programming on the PDP-11, through the simple PC era where we had the, you know, the 64K PCs with the, with the ASCII output, through modern PCs where we have that same phenomenal level of computational power, in this case in our briefcases, to a new world where there are tons of different computing devices, things you not necessarily even think of a computing device, like your car, which certainly is a computing device of the first order, all talking to each other and all out there. So what I think we're in is a world of gadgets, where the gadget is often thought of as something small that you carry in your pocket, like your phone, which it could be, but you know, second light can be a gadget. It's some um, new type of largely electronic thing which does something talking to other electronic things. We're in a world of gadgets. And one of the projects in the Computer Mediated Living Group is called Gadgeteer. And that's what I want to talk mainly about today. Gadgeteer is about building gadgets. We want to make it easy to build gadgets in this new world that we're in. So we have a toolkit for quickly constructing, programming, and shaping, and I'll get to that, that's quite important, new co computing devices or gadgets. And we want to be able to go from an idea that you have to a working device as easy and as quickly as possible. We want there to be a very low threshold. It should be very easy to build a simple device. A child should be able to build a simple device. And in fact, children have used Gadgeteer to build simple devices. But it should have a high ceiling. We should be able to build very complex things that interact with other devices in complex ways to form part of this new ecosystem that I'm talking about. Those are two goals, and I think, we've, I think that we've largely achieved those. So there are three components to Gadgeteer, and I'm going to talk about all three. I should actually add another little aside here. About 20 of you attended a Gadgeteer tutorial this morning, so you all know more about this than I do, so I apologize right now for, uh, for anything that I, might get, uh, that I might get wrong, but I'm very pleased that there are those of you that did attend the tutorial this morning. Um, but the three components of this are modular hardware, so bits of hardware that are easy to plug and play together, Software, in this case, a very nice object-oriented IDE-supported programming system um, to let you program these, these, uh, these gadgets at a high level. And very interestingly, 3D modeling. Let's make it easy to put these gadgets in nice housings, make them easy, easy to hold and use. So there's those three aspects of Gadgeteer. We initially built Gadgeteer largely as a tool for ourselves in MSR because in the group that Judith mentioned that I founded a few years ago and, and continue to run, the Computer Mediated Living Group, we really like to, to think up new gadgets or new, new ways of interacting. And when we do that, we want to get real instantiations of that new technique or new idea into people's hands and see how they react to it. And so in order to do that, we have to build things. And Gadgeteer is one way that we can build those easily. So it was for our own purposes initially. But since then, um, other researchers have become very interested in it. So we've been getting other people to, to use it in the same vein we do. But also, we've had a lot of interest from hobbyists and educators. We took it to the Maker Fair uh, last year, I think. Nick can tell you more about that. And it was tremendously popular. The, you know, it, it, it's almost like the hobbyist era of the PC. People are getting really interested in what they can build with this stuff. Um, and so we're now working actively on getting Gadgeteer out of the lab and into, uh, into the hands of people in the wider world. And I'll tell you more about what's happening on that front later, but it's going, you know, it's going very well. Let me just take a drink here. 
So the heart of the Gadget Geo system is this modular hardware platform that allows the modules to be easily, easily connected to each other to form new, new functional gadgets. Um, and each of the module adds some sort of capability, right? And we can, add up, we can add new modules all the time as well, but you can imagine modules to take pictures, to play sounds, to sense the environment, to talk to other devices, all of these things to enable user interaction um, um, are, all, are all needed. The core of the thing is a relatively low power, as it turns out, compared to my phone even, um, ARM core, uh, with nonetheless quite a lot of memory off of it. Um, and the idea is that it has a number of sockets. At the moment, I think we may have added one or two, but labeled A through O. And basically, if you have, when you, when you build a new module, it will be on one of a few types of standard interfaces labeled with the corresponding letter. And you can plug that module into any available socket that has that same letter on it. We tried to mix and match those so that the, the, the number of types of modules that you would usually want to plug in roughly, roughly lines up. Um, but there's no soldering involved. Uh, you just plug and play, and away you go. So what are the modules that we built so far? There's, there's quite a number of them. The main two are the main board that I just talked about, and the USB device, this one is one that does three things. It provides power to the unit, and I'll tell you more about why it's, uh, power comes from the outside at the moment, or at least it did until recently. Um, it provides a programming interface, so you can, you can write software to run these things. Um, and it also makes the, the, the main board thing that you're building look like a USB device to the outside world, which can be, which, which can be useful. There's a bunch of user, out, of user interface elements. So the other USB device is one that actually allows you to plug other USB devices into the gadget that you're building. That's the USB host. But there's a bunch of ordinary sort of UI type things. There's a simple button interface. There's LEDs that you can turn on and off. There's an, an, um, an OLED display. Um, there's a touch screen that isn't shown here, but we have a little touch screen. Uh, and there's uh, rotary switches, D-pads, which are those sort of game pad style switches, the four-way switches there, so a bunch of those. Um, there are sensor modules. There's a light level RGB sensor. There's an ultrasonic ranger, temperature and humidity, a burglar alarm style passive IR sensor. Um, there are multimedia objects too. There's a, there's a camera. Uh, there's audio, which is both for input and output. Um, there are various networking modules. So there's two different USB serial um, units. The reason there's two, one of them is red and one of them is not red. The ones that are red also provide power. And uh, that'll become important in something at all tell you about in just a minute. But we have various radio interfaces. We have Zigbee. We have Wi-Fi. We have an Ethernet interface. We have an uh, 868 megahertz radio. You know, so we have lots of ways. As I said, one of the things very important about modern gadgets is they can talk to each other. They can talk to the cloud. We have ways of making that easy. Um, we have storage modules. The, uh, there's a slightly different USB host module that allows you to plug um, things like memory sticks and things into things to get storage. We also have an SD card interface to allow you to get storage, lots of storage. Uh, we have some actuators for motor and servo control. We have some relay units that I haven't shown here. Uh, um, uh, and there's ways, oh, this is, this is, this is actually quite important. Um, you can attach non-gadgeteer hardware to your gadgeteer gadget if you want. You would use these lower level hardware um, I.O. Uh, modules in order to talk to electronic devices that you bought from someplace else that aren't actually gadgeteer modules. Uh, I'm going to be and we have a few um, modules that we're still building. One of them that has a, um, a gyro and an accelerometer in it to do 3D orientation. And now th these other two, we'll come back to why some of the modules are red and some of them aren't. You might think, why wasn't one of the first things we did build a battery module? Because these things are going to be devices you want to carry in your pocket. They should be battery powered. It's a bit tricky when we have external powered modules as well because lithium batteries explode if you get backflow into them. So we just had to be very, because we want to get this widely used, we had to be very, very careful to engineer the battery unit so that it was safe. We have done that now. And so there is now a, a, uh, a battery unit. And likewise for DC power from something like a car battery, which we also wanted to enable. We just had to do it very, very carefully. So the kind of takeaway message here is we've already got a lot of modules, right? You could build a lot of stuff. You can, you know, probably even j just with this, you'd be almost unlimited in the types of things you could build. And I mean, people early on started building really, really fun things. I mean, this, this is somebody, I don't, can't remember, we'll have to ask Nick whether this was at Maker Faire or where this was, but somebody, a non-Microsoft person, built a, um, a line-following robot. That's what this is. This, all, just using Gadgeteer, this is a line-following robot. It has two of the RGB sensors on the bottom of it to track 
uh, black versus white to be able to track the line of the robot. It's got a camera on board to take pictures while it does it. It's got an ultrasonic sensor on the front so it doesn't bump into walls. It's got two short range infrared sensors on the side also to keep it from sort of bumping into things and help it steer. Um, and interestingly, it has a Wi-Fi module in it which the software talks to an Azure service in the cloud which then enables it to be remote controlled from a Windows 7 phone. So this is, this is really quite something. And you know, whoever did this knocked it up fairly quickly just using the, just using the Gadgeteer stuff. So um, you, know, you, can, you can do some quite sophisticated things with this already. Um, but just to give you a flavor, I'm going to show you a little video of something much simpler than that. This is, this is Nick, uh, Nick Viller, who was the one who, uh, who, who with James Scott gave you the um, tutorial this morning. Um, this is a little video of somebody making a camera. See how long this takes. So there's the main board with the, that um, USB hosting on it. That it looks like the OLED display. No, no, sir, that's the SD card. So you plug an SD card to store the pictures. And that's the, that's the OLED module. We need somewhere to, somewhere to see the pictures. Let's attach that. What else do we need? We need, uh, we need a camera. So there's the camera module. Uh, plug the camera module in there into one of the matching slots. I don't know what letter it is, but there's several of them. And we need a shutter button now, I think. So there's a button coming up. Let's add the button. Now here comes the magic of software. Let's hook it up to our, oh no wait, in, in goes the SD card first. Now the magic of software, and the power that is. Plug in the USB, you'll see some lines showing up on the screen, that's the software being uploaded there. Um, and now, it's a camera. Press the button, it takes a picture. That's Nick. So there you go, from, from nothing to a working digital camera in very short order. So that's the, you know, that's the, that's that, the, that's the, that's the power of Gadgeteer. I think it's really quite something. Now, the, the magic of software part. Um, the software development environment for Gadgeteer is based on the .NET micro framework. So we have this very powerful software infrastructure behind this to make it easy to use high-level programming languages, rich libraries to, to program these things. And you get the full power of a Visual Studio IDE when you're, um, when you're doing this. And we've written uh, an, an, an SDK with classes that encapsulate all of the modules that we've done so far and uh, other lower level interfaces as well. So if you want to think of this in a sort of software stack way, the bottom three there are essentially the .NET framework. There's the, the sort of the, the CLR, which abstracts the hardware, class the .NET framework class libraries that are built on top of that. And then the stuff in orange is the, is the code that you would write as the, as the gadgeteer. And, um, but you do that using the green stuff, which we give you, which is a whole bunch of really rich libraries. For every single module there is, there's a class that lets you, uh, that lets you interact with the module in you know, any way that, that makes sense for that module, for the camera, for the Wi-Fi. So the guy who wrote that um, line following robot must have used the, um, the Wi-Fi module to write the Azure service to let it talk to the cloud and so on. Um, but there are also these lower level interfaces, I squared C and, and sort of other things. So as I said, if you, have, um, if you have a piece of hardware that's not a gadgetry module, you can still hook it up and use it as part of your gadget. Uh, and you just use these slightly lower level APIs to, um, uh, to do that. Um, and so we, um, we wanted to make it very easy to program these things. So we really went to town on building as much as we could into Visual Studio to make it easy. So this is the kind of software engineering type things that you'd expect. But something simple like a, the sort of namespace alias, so you, the modules are easy to find. As you type, the modules that are available then come up. And their, um, their names are unabbreviated, so it's pretty clear from the name what they do. But if that's not clear enough and you hover, you get inline help to see what they do. Uh, we have a thread safe event model, so you're not going to run into too much trouble that way if you, if you stick to those, uh, to, our, to our, own, our own software. Um, we auto generate the event handlers. Uh, uh, there's, there's a bunch more. There's, there's a lot of rich you know, software engineering things that we bring to Gadget here to, um, to make it easy. We, we've, we've written a number of templates. There's a, there's a basic application template, there's a couple of graphics. Um, application templates, a simple graphics one. And th so you can do, there's a, there's a nice API for drawing very simple graphics to that OLED screen, uh, which lets you build things like that camera very quickly. There's actually the full power of the Windows presentation framework also available to you. We have modules for that. So, and you can choose whether to use the simple or the, or the, um, 
or the complex library, depending on, on what level you're at. You might use the simple one first and then dive into the more complex one later as you build up your gadget. Um, and we have, we have examples to go along with that. Um, so let me give you another example because I, now I want to get into the third aspect. And we talked about um, the modular hardware. We've talked about the software. The third example, uh, the, the, the third component is the, uh, the 3D modeling side of things. But let's look at another example. So the task here, get 24 hours to build a working Tetris, handheld Tetris game unit. So first of all, let's build the hardware. The hardware took five minutes to build. It's pretty much like the camera. Very, very simple. What, what do we need? We need a screen so we can see the, the Tetris pieces. We need, we need the power source and the some programming socket like we always do. It's there. We need a knob, a turning knob, so that we can rotate the pieces. You all know how to play Tetris, right? So you, you want to rotate them as they fall. We need a knob to turn. Uh, we need one of those four-way D-pad game controller type switches to control the, the placement of the piece, right? You move it back and forth as you're, as you're turning it, as they drop. Um, and that's all we need. So it took five minutes to plug those things together, and away we go. Software, of course, not quite so easy. It took a few hours to write the software. You can see, you know, there's the, uh, the, um, uh, the method that rotates the piece. I won't go through exactly how it worked, because I'm not sure I'd be able to, but you, can, you sort of get the idea. Um, and the code, you know, five hours is, that, that's probably generous, actually, right? but, uh, to write something like this. But so we write the software. Then we build the case. Now, we used um, SolidWorks. It's the, it's the CAD package that we've been using mainly for Gadget here at the moment. And we've actually built a plugin for SolidWorks so that as you design the case, it automatically tells you it knows about all of the Gadget here modules. So it, if you're using uh, any of those existing Gadget here modules, the CAD package knows exactly how big they are, how they can fit together, where the bushes have to go, where the mounting pillars go. So that's all automatic. You don't have to worry about that. So uh, if you, as long as you know something about 3D CAD, you can build your model. Um, now there's six hours. Now this is six hours when you can do something else, right? This is six hours of the 3D printer printing away uh, to build that case with all its, its sort of bushings and things that you have designed. Uh, then you cut the case out, you put the whole thing together. That takes maybe half an hour, and you have a working Tetris game. Now you may not believe that it's a working Tetris game, so I'll prove it. Here is Nick, just in fact last week playing with the Tetris. You game. rotated a bit. Uh, no, it didn't make sense. I didn't realize there was audio on this Nick, but there you go. <laughs> So there is Nick playing with the Tetris game that was built in 24 yeah. hours using the Tetris here. Now, now it is still powered because we hadn't built the, the battery module by then, but now it would be able to be completely powered by, powered by batteries. I didn't manage to get rid of them there. <laughs> I think that's pretty good. Like it does, it should. Um, but so the, the aspect of, of, of the, um, the handheld Tetris game that I think is interesting is that physical design aspect. And I think that's where this gets really interesting and takes us to, to a kind of new place. Because, you know, another aspect that is changing in the world is the ready availability of things that will turn 3D designs into physical objects. 3D printing, CRC machines, laser cutters, all very popular. And there's two ways of doing this. You can buy one of these machines yourself, and they're no longer nearly as messy as they used to be. There's no messy chemicals, you know, and you can, or, but, but if you don't want to be involved with them at all, there's tons of companies where you can just upload your CAD file and they'll post you the rendered thing a couple of days later. It's, it's really quite something. And this Thing Lab is a place that does both of those things. You can either buy the latest um, 3D rendering sort of printers from, uh, from them or they'll, they'll just take your CAD file and send you something rendered. And they, they have all sorts of different ways of doing it, so they can send you things in, in various materials, not just plastic. Um, but, you know, it, this is really becoming mainstream. You go to the HP website, and they've got inkjet printers, and they've got desktop printers, and they've got photo printers, and they've got 3D printers. You can just, they're just online now. And they, this one is still, this, these are pretty expensive. This one's about $10,000, I think. But they're coming down rapidly in price. There are, there are other companies that sell, you can get a reasonable 3D printer for under $2,000 now, I think. So this, this really is becoming mainstream. So, you know, we, we wanted this kind of thing to make it easier for us to build custom enclosures for the gadgets that that we were building, largely for our kind of rapid prototyping exercises that I've talked about. And as I said, we've built a plugin for SolidWorks to make it easier to, 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 to do this sort of enclosure design. And we're planning to do the same for other 3D CAD packages. It's, it's, it's not that hard as you can imagine. But let's think for a moment about, you know, think about this aspect of Gadgeteer and where that might take us in the future. Because there's a couple of things happening here. First of all, there's lots of 3D design packages available. I think these are all free, or almost free. The Google SketchUp is free, 3D Tin is free, 
Island of Sketch might not be free, but there's a lot of these 3D design packages that are available that are easy to use. And Google's was actually intended initially, I think, to make models for Google Earth or for, for the, the Street View thing, and it's been co-opted and used for all sorts of design things, but it's particularly easy to use. Um, but and all, of these, all of these things can be used to generate files that can be either 3D printed yourself or sent to one of those, um, one of those sort of in-house printing agencies. Um, and then there's companies like Shapeways. Now this is also really interesting. Shapeways is a company where you, you design something. You design a bracelet or whatever else it is. Uh, you upload your design to Shapeways and they will send you the rendered thing. And like uh, Thing Lab, they have a bunch, they, they have 3D printers and CRC machines and laser cutters. They can do it in all sorts of different ways, but they will send you a 3D rendering in whatever material that, they'll, that, that you want, at least of the ones that they can do. So you design a bracelet, you say, send me a copper version of this bracelet in this size. Great, you get yours back. The catch, the sort of interesting thing here is that your design stays on file and is public. So if somebody else goes along and says, I like that bracelet, but I like it with my name and I like it in this size. Click, it shows up in silver in your size with your name on it, and the person who designed it gets a cut. So there's this, there's this whole 3D design marketplace going on that is, that is just bound to take off. But again, it gets better because electronics are becoming printable. Right? There are things we can now print conductors and transistors and certain kinds of OLEDs. It's not going to be too long before you can just upload an electronic design and have, it ha and have it printed using the same kind of technology and put that in whatever case that you've got. So the kinds of things that you can build with Gadgeteer will be able to be completely manufactured on spec, one at a time, tailored to how you want them. So I mean, I, I really think this is going to be something new. Like we, we may end up in a world where we can specify ourselves or tailor somebody else's design and create or buy somebody else's design any kind of gadget you want that is personalized to, the, to, to our own needs. And that can be personalized in the electronics that are in it, in the shape that it has, in the whatever, you know, in, in either a sort of physical or electronic way. And I think this is, this uh, phrase that I put in italics is really the key. I think we're moving into a world where hardware is now going to start to evolve almost as fast as software does. And that really changes things for what software is all about. It makes it a lot harder because, you know, as with the PC, it's probably going to be the hobbyists and, well, no, it, it is and it will be the hobbyists and enthusiasts and professionals like us who will be doing this kind of thing first. But eventually, you know, your, your, your grandmother could want a new type of tracking device for your grandfather who has early stages of Alzheimer's. She goes to some site, she says, well, it shouldn't be, you know, it should be this shape or this size or it should have this, this like, feature that I want. And she might not write it herself, but she can specify it. And bingo, a new one would show up. And I, you know, this, and that's just the tip of the iceberg because it also doesn't have to be little gadgets. These could be big things like, like surfaces that are being tailored and manufactured. It's, it's really quite, quite something, I think. And so, um, yeah, as I said, there's, and there'll be this, there, there, there is actually starting to be, and when the electronics printing comes of age, there really probably will be this new on-spec design and build on demand marketplace for objects and a whole new sort of marketplace for people that want to design these things as well as, as, well as use them. So I think that building the software to drive this world is going to present us, us in this room a lot of challenges, a lot of interesting, difficult, and fascinating challenges because it just makes it a lot more complex. In the old days, you kind of knew what the hardware was and it wasn't going to change in the next month. You know, it might change over the next five years, just get faster launch. It's largely the same thing that you were building for, the same type of interfaces. Whereas this, there'll be new interfaces all the time, right? Second line, look at second line, look at other things like that. So, so, and, and it's all going to be talking to the cloud, like I said. All, all, this, uh, all this communication um, technology as well. So let's go back to this graph that I wrote at the start and see what, what this means. I guess just a way of sort of illustrating what I said is that we are now, technology is moving on so much that the blue line almost doesn't matter anymore. It's going to carry on going up, but we've got a lot of room between the yellow line and the blue line already. So we've got a lot of stuff we can do. And I like to think that this sort of personalized gadgets idea, even in the early days when it's just being used by us, will be a way of letting us explore this boundary between what we could do, which is almost anything, and what we should do, what will make sense for us, what will be good for us you know, aesthetically, what will be good for us environmentally, what will be good for us socially, all these things. And you know, we can hopefully ring fence an area and just start building those kind of things. So, so that's my kind of pitch for, for where the future is going. Um, I'm going to come back briefly to today now. Um, you know, take my future hat off and just tell you tell you what's happening with 
gadget here, because maybe you could be part of this, this new wave um, of stuff. Because we're, we are using gadget here for our own purposes, as I said. So you know, one example is we had a project looking at um, making home heating control better by predicting the occupancy of rooms. And we built a little gadget that was put in each room of several people's houses to do that. And we used Gadgeteer for that. And we hope that you know, some of you will want to use Gadgeteer for research projects like that. Uh, and you'll, you will be able to, because um, over the next few weeks, Gadgeteer is going to be released as an open source project. So all the software will come out under an Apache license of some kind, I think. All of the designs, the hardware designs, will be coming out on a Creative Commons license of some kind, again, I believe. Um, and we're building a big, um, what we hope will be a big community website to drive the interest and the, uh, the sort of cross-enthusiasm in, in this area. Uh, and in terms of the hardware, we've, we have a manufacturing partner who's going to be building um, the main board and a few of the modules, I'm not sure exactly which ones, very soon. So by, I think, early summer, you'll be able to buy this stuff. And the, the starter kit with a, um, with a main board and a few modules will be relatively cheap. And more modules are going to be coming out from that partner and probably from others as well. We hope to really drive a big ecosystem around this. Hardware manufacturers building modules, uh, people, you know, people doing experiments and driving the software in an, in an open source fashion. So, um, so we're going to be working with uh, teachers, university teachers and high school teachers to drive uh, hardware design curricula around this idea. There's a lot of interest in that. And if any of you is interested in this, you know, please do get in touch with us about that. Uh, and let me put in a little plug for the Gadgeteer demo. I think um, Andrew mentioned that tomorrow there's a demo fest. You can come and see Gadgeteer live, those of you that weren't at the tutorial this morning. I think that'll give you a better flavor for what it is. And you can see, f you, you can see for yourself whether you think that, um, that sort of image of the future that I've pitched will come to be or not. Um, but I think at that, I will, um, uh, I will leave it. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you to, um, uh, to Nick and James who are actually here, who um, uh, are very much behind the whole Gadgeteer, the whole Gadgeteer project, and Steve, who also is involved in as the manager. Um, and I believe, now I hope this is right, Judith, that um, that everybody got a Pepper Mill power board as part of their pack, did they? They did. Good. So um, I'm not going to talk much about that. In fact, I'm not going to talk at all about that. But this, in terms of this hardware-software boundary, making hardware sort of easily accessible, the Pepper Mill project is part of that. It's basically a board that will allow you to build a um, a human-powered human interface device. And um, there is a postcard that came with it, which will explain a little bit about it, but it will can take you to a website that will explain a lot about it. So, um, so do have a look at that, and um, thank you very much. So are we? Yeah. So I mean, I'm 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 happy to take uh, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. And I guess do we need a microphone for that? Yeah. What's that? You can show them. Okay, go on. Hello. Yeah, this, uh, is the, this is your Pepinol part of you. Uh, my name is Mats Brosen from KTH in Scotland, Sweden. Um, what are your plans regarding the software, um, the, the development environment, uh, for instance? Um, this looks like something that could rival the Lego robots and the National Instrument uh, uh, software environment for, for programming Lego robots. You mean other than sort of well, me okay. or ah, okay. Um, I don't yeah, so, so the question revolved around the software development environment. Can we bring down the five hours for getting a working camera down to ten minutes? Oh, I see. So now. Can you hear me now? now? Uh, can, I, I don't have control over this, so maybe I can move the mic. Sorry, I hope you can hear the talk. <laughs> so I'm relating this how, to how, the. How I'm relating this to the national instruments, like the lab view style uh, they have for the Lego robots. Yeah, I'm. I'm aware. I'm just. I'm trying to think of. If you mean, are we doing work? Like you said, if we could cut down that sort of five hours. Now I don't know. I don't think other than than doing what we can to make the. The, um, the modules and the software that goes with them is easy to use in the current IDE. I don't think we're doing any research on, on sort of programming techniques for this kind of work. Now, I would love it if some of you out there would do that kind of work. You know, we, we really do want to make this a sort of you know, beachhead for a lot more work in this, in this general area because we think it's going to be very important. But we're not doing any of that sort of software engineering work um, ourselves, largely. I mean, Nick and James may disagree, but I don't think we are. 
More questions? Question here. Yeah. No? Okay. Hi. Oh. Uh, Ursula Martin from Queen Mary University of London. I think this is great fun. You know, I want one now to play with. Um, oh, you, but you have one soon. What about, what about the dark side of all this? What about um, build your own IED, build your own mini spy plane, build your own nasty stuff, and all the people who might be interested in building their own nasty stuff? Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's actually quite a good point. I guess that's kind of you know, what I meant when I said that that yellow line can go up and down. It can obviously go very much down. Um, now, I, I mean, that's a, an age-old argument, though, about technology being used for good and bad things, and I'm not sure you know, I'm not exactly sure what we can do to sort of address it as part of this effort. I mean, we can certainly, as a, as a sort of society, caution against it, and I suppose try to do what we, what we could to, to keep these things from being used for, for bad purposes. But I'm not, I don't know, it's just, it's, that's, that seems to me to be part of a much, much bigger question. Uh, yeah, sure. So if, yeah, uh, if, if uh, so to speak, somebody comes home, go, comes, comes over from Afghanistan, goes into Maplin, buys a box of this stuff, and goes home, that's yeah. Just well, I, too I bad. guess I guess I take your point. I'm just not entirely sure um, whether you're saying that we simply shouldn't do it for that reason or, or not. I mean, it's a I'm just yeah. No, it's certainly I, it's a very valid point, and I maybe I didn't make it clear enough when I was showing the graph, but it's uh, I do take your point. Okay, uh, Kim Larsen, Lopburg University, Denmark. So do you see this kind of chair just as uh, having a, it, an educational purpose or do you see it also as something that could be used in a professional style to have, you know, come up with uh, quick prototypes in, in a professional environment, say hospitals or, or factories or whatever, where you can see a need for new devices, new software? Yeah, it's, it's absolutely for both of those things and, and more. But those, I mean, those two that, that you highlighted are the two real initial uses. I think in education, it's, it's going to be tremendously valuable because it makes it so easy for people to get their hands on the hardware. You know, if you imagine the old days, I don't know whether you ever had these sort of plug and play breadboard things when you were a kid to learn electronics, but this is like a much more sophisticated version of that that lets you build things that can, you know, where you can really start to understand how the electronics interacts with the software. So I think that's very important. Um, but on the other hand, you can, you can build things that are robust enough for real people to use. And we're certainly using them, as I said, in this home heating project. And we have a, lo a lot of other projects where we think in terms of doing rapid prototyping for both experimentation, but perhaps even for sort of early product evaluation. You could certainly use it for that. So yes, I think, I think both of those things are, are, are where they, the initial application will, will be. Any other questions? No, you can all go to the break earlier, if, if not. Um. Yes, uh, thanks for the nice talk. I was just uh, curious, how difficult is the programming uh, for this gadgeteer stuff? Uh, do you... Well, I think, I think for simple things, it's, it's quite easy, because all, all the modules, as I said, expose quite a natural uh, sort of interface to how they should be used. I think if you want to start programming hardware that is not gadgeteer hardware module, it would get a lot harder. And so that's why we, 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 we want to make it extensible so that we can, somebody who maybe does that once could then turn a new piece of hardware into a properly supported gadgeteer module. Uh, but I, you know, it's, it's sort of hard to judge how easy or not it is. I think it's, it's a lot easier to build these kind of things now than it would have been without the gadgeteer modules that, are, that sort of form part of that software library. Uh, but I don't know whether that answers your question or not. What, Yes, the more skilled you are, the more complicated gadgets you can build. But just, for instance, would you be conceivable to have an introductory programming class based on gadget here? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Because I mean, you know, you you can keep it very simple. Building things like that game and the camera is really quite straightforward, and that would be, you know, sim simple things like that, which nonetheless give you the right kind of sort of understanding of the various aspects of this this boundary between the hardware and the, and the software would be well, well, well within the grasp of you know, late high school or early undergraduate education, absolutely. Andrew. Oh dear, what's this? <laughs> it's a slightly self-serving question, <laughs> like, um, useful data. And what, what's the kind of largest size object you can practically make in one of these printing machines? And you know, how many objects an hour can you make? Uh, well, at the moment, relatively small and relatively slow. Right, so I think, I'm just trying to think now, you know, Nick would probably be better to answer this than me, but the one we have in the lab is probably limited to something about, I don't know, probably the size that you saw of that, um, uh, 
uh, of that um, the sort of cutouts for that Tetris game. So it's roughly sort of set, set like a square foot, and I don't know how deep. Um, now I think the the uh, the larger units that that the that the agencies use probably a lot larger than that. But I don't know what the you know I don't think that you could build a second light unit 3D printed at the moment. You have to 3D print the parts and then and then and then assemble them, but which is which is also a fine way to design them. Yeah. Actually, there was a second part of your question: the size and the um, oh, and the time. The time is still relatively long, as you said. As you saw, I took six hours to print that that fairly small one. But as with all these things, the cost is coming down, the time is coming down as well. But I think we're, when you're talking about physical things, you're up against some physical limits where it will never get, you know, obviously quite as fast as the electronics. Um, so I think personalization is great, and I think it's it's really important that we do research that explores, especially you know things like things like hardware customization and personalization. But um, you, you concluded by sort of equating that that hardware and software would would co-evolve in, in some sense. But I'm just wondering whether software has so many more degrees of freedom, so many more ways in which um, you know you can actually change the functionality of your gadgets that in fact. The, the, the personal gadgetry customization that you're talking about or personalization is always going to be a, a much smaller niche and that if, if people are going to really specialize and do something, they want, want something, they'll probably go to a professional to do it, whereas if they want to really personalize and play around with personalization, software offers them so much more ability to vary the, the scope of what they do. I wonder if you yeah, have any comments I mean, I think, on that. I think you're exactly right. I think that hardware is never going to catch up to software. I, I don't think it can because, it, because of its physical nature. But I think that that line is going to move, though. I think, and, you know, it's, it's up, you know, prediction is hard, especially about the future, as they say. So, so who knows where this is going to go, but I do think that that line is going to move. Now, how far it moves, I don't really know. Maybe it won't move very far, far at all, in, which will be your place. Maybe it'll move a long way. But they'll certainly, I'm not saying that hardware will ever evolve as fast as software does, but it's just evolving and has the capability to evolve so much faster than it did that I think that that will cause a change in there. Yeah. Yeah. Ganesh Gopalakrishnan from the University of Utah. Uh, when will we see a personal, uh, personalized uh, open source Kinect device that we can hack as part <laughs> of uh, Gadget here? I think I'm going to leave that question alone, but, uh, <laughs> but I do take your point. <laughs> Uh, hello, Caroline Hummels, and of University of Technology. I very much liked it, and I tried it this morning. Um, okay. But I do have a question. I have a background in design. And a few years ago, people said, well, the designer will be out of work, but slowly but certainly, everyone will become a designer. Um, what does this do for Microsoft as a company? Will in the end, the shift be that more people get programming skills, and that slowly but certainly, the character of Microsoft will be something else, more like a meta computer scientist instead of the downward side. Wow. Well, again, that's a very long-range, uh, long-range vision, and I really, um, I don't know, because I think I think there will be some aspects of the the more traditional software development that will that will hang on. I don't think things like the, uh, you know, your your PC at home or your laptop are going to go away. I think the way they interact with these devices that we'll build will change. I think the role of the designer is going to increase. I don't think it's going to decrease. Even if people are kind of doing their own designs, a really good designer is still going to have a market and have a much more readily, a much longer tailed market for what they do because of this thing, because of this marketplace that is going to be enabled. So that's what I'd say. Great. Well, I think on that very uh, positive note, then uh, it's a good place to end. And I'd like to thank Ken very much for his inspiring talk and all the videos and for telling us some things that probably we never even thought about. Thanks, Ken. Thank you very much.